thanks for everyone who's here in person. We've got a full room as well as uh, lots of people online. So we'll jump right into the the uh, agenda today. Um, first of all, we have approval of minutes. Um, it's made from our July meeting. Correct? So um, I have a motion to approve the meeting, the minutes from our last meeting. My motion to approve the meeting minutes from July of this year. All right, we have a motion to approve. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that's approved. So now we'll jump into the um, next item on our agenda, statewide strategic plan update. So we have, looks like we have Jordan here. Ooh, I moved lighting. Yeah, moved lighting. And one other thing is that we have our a new UDOT representative. Oh, yes, yes. Um, so you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Um, thanks for having me. I'm Josh Andura. I believe Terry Newell mm -hmm. was uh, your UDOT person previously. Mm -hmm. um, she retired last month. She did. She did. She yeah. now lives in Colorado. Oh, so, um, yeah, a little, fast when you can. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like a woodworking farming compound that uh -huh. she's building. And so we wish her the best and, of course, miss her. And I'm sure many of you knew her well. So, hopefully, I can do almost as well as she did. And you are you're the also the, the trails coordinator that's that's managing the, the active transportation correct planning yep. as well, which I think is a great nexus with the work that we do here. There's there's a lot of uh, I think it just it will be very helpful to have you as part of this um, to get your perspective on what's going on with the active transportation uh, initiatives as well. And obviously, this is an area that I feel strongly about, so I'm happy to be here. Fantastic. Happy to help in any way. Yeah. Um, can I just add, it does say he's technical advisor, but he's actually a commissioner. Yes, because we made that, because that yeah. change was made with the bill yeah. in this last oh. session where we switched uh, yeah. the to uh, Okay. All right. We'll turn the time to Jordan. Thank you, Representative Stankwest. It's good to see everybody again. Uh, I did get to see you last month. Uh, many of you, it hasn't been too long since we did our, our spring workshop series which we're going to hear a little bit more about today. Um, there were a couple handouts on the cardinal directions and the objectives for the strategic plan. If we could get those passed around, that would be helpful. Okay. But really what we're going to spend the bulk of our time talking about today is working towards uh, some general consensus among the commissioners on what these cardinal directions are and the specific objectives. Because we do have uh, Josh here, I'm going to go back into a little bit of the scope and make sure we all have the big check boxes that we have checked off so far as part of the, the planning and analysis work, um, as well as the workshop series that we ran last fall. So I'm going to go through a, a brief overview of the spec structure of the strategic plan and how all of the supporting reports that we have delivered or are in the process of delivering uh, will contribute to that strategic planning, that, that strategic plan itself. Uh, and then Casey's going to jump in and give you a formal presentation on our comparative analysis. Uh, I kind of briefly walked through a couple of the main findings last month uh, where we looked at outdoor recreation within Utah and how management systems funding uh, compared to other Western states. Casey's going to dive into our main recommendations there. Um, and then really the bulk of the second part of the presentation is going to focus on these objectives. And working towards consensus amongst the commissioners. Jordan, can I interject just really quickly? Um, I I kind of want to maybe uh, provide the higher level context as well because we've been working on the strategic plan now for more than a year. We had those ser those series of workshops last year, gathered a lot of really good data, did that second round this spring, and so now all of that information uh, that you've been able to compile and everything you've been able to put together. Now this strategic plan is in, uh, is in front of this commission, and so now it's it's really up to this commission to decide what you know really finalize this plan. Uh, and then over the next couple months, not not today, but I mean this is sort of like we're in that phase 
of this process now where it's it's up to the commission to, to do the refinement and take it from draft to final presentation. So this is, you know, it's really it's it's on it's on our plates now as a commission. Right. And that's really what we've what we've been working towards, at least getting us uh, organized around the major objectives. What are, what is that strategic ob ob vision for the for the Outdoor Adventure Commission, for everybody that really touches outdoor recreation within Utah, uh, what are those major objectives that we really want everybody's, everybody in this room, as well as many of the stakeholders who are, who are not represented that participate in those workshops, how to make sure that their objectives are represented. Um, so if you recall that there was five particular pieces that were involved in the strategic planning for the first, well, it was a funding analysis where we took the index size of how the state funds outdoor recreation, uh, and we, we presented uh, the findings from that report uh, several months ago. Uh, today, you're going to get a detailed review of the comparative analysis, so how outdoor recreation management within Utah compares to the other 11, 11 Western states where there's some opportunities for leverage given our state's investment in outdoor recreation infrastructure, how we can utilize that. Uh, to mobilize uh, collaboration and partnerships across the many people that do manage and support outdoor recreation within the state. Uh, there's a, also a series of workshops that you all participated in, at least one or a couple of those workshops. Uh, Josh, unfortunately, weren't able to make it to those, but uh, we had a great time. We had very good representation from many people across the state, uh, federal, uh, state, municipal, uh, and county representation at all of the meetings that we're at. We have now presented that report to the Division of Outdoor Recreation, or at least provided that report to them uh, for their for their comment. Uh, we will be presenting the stakeholder workshop findings and the key recommendations, the policy recommendations uh, at the next Outdoor Adventure Commission. Uh, so that's uh, still to be still to be seen. And then the last two things were a study of the supply and demand for outdoor recreation across the state. So bigger assets like state parks or particular areas where we have really good metrics for how outdoor recreation demand is changing or how outdoor recreation supply is currently provided across the state. Uh, we are compiling that information and working on developing that report. So we can identify where those gaps are between supply and demand. There might be some areas where, where we're, we're currently seeing too much supply, we have to get more infrastructure on the ground, it's not being, not being made. Um, but more likely it's gonna be the inverse where we're seeing a lot more and not enough infrastructure. And then we also have a statewide need survey uh, that was just meant to provide some top line numbers on general public's interest in supporting other recreation investments. So how, what, what's the level of support for maintenance or for particular types of infrastructure investment? So all of these really are contributing to the strategic plan as a whole. The strategic plan itself is really comprised of these general cardinal directions that we presented and workshopped with workshop participants over the course of those seven workshops that we held this spring. Um, so those cardinal directions that you see, you see in front of you are really the, the big picture uh, vision for what the state needs to work towards. Uh, these are things that we all probably primarily value as outdoor recreation providers, as outdoor recreation managers. And then the specific objectives are more key directions for why we need to work towards that broader direction, or more specific objectives for why we need to work towards that, that specific direction. Uh, so that needs that were identified by multiple stakeholders in multiple regions across the state and general statewide needs um, and we're going to walk through those uh, in a little bit um, a little bit uh, more detail when we go through um, them point by point later on so the idea for what the plan is actually going to look like you've seen a lot of recommendations from us in our individual reports on the funding report, you'll hear some from, from Casey in the comparative analysis report. Those are recommendations that are coming from us as a independent research team. But really what we want to get the, the commission on board with, I thought that was me for a second. Uh, what we want to get the commission on board with is the cardinal directions and objectives. These are really the, the key directions, the key pillars that we need to move towards. Uh, as a state, as individual agencies that all support outdoor recreation in some regard. So we, what we would like to see the commission ultimately achieve with a strategic planning effort is consensus on what these 12 objectives are, not specifically a consensus on what all of these 
specific policy program and project recommendations are. We realize there's a lot of detail in there, some of which might be four or five years off from actually being even able to be implemented. Some are very, very specific to one agency. And so there's really not a lot, a lot of a need for the commission to, to get on board with supporting that particular recommendation. Um, but what we would like to see is consensus among these broad objectives that we have all of our bases covered that what you heard in the workshops this spring is accurately reflected in each of these objectives that if your agency could could commit to working towards these objectives if the agencies that you interact with in those spring workshops committed to working towards these objectives after recreation opportunities in the state would be improved so the question um so the focus right now I mean, I think it's good to start at a high level with the cardinal directions and objective, objectives. Would you anticipate that the, the, the policies, projects, and programs would also be included in the plan? They can be, they can be recommendations as like- So maybe not in the plan, but just external recommendations or part of the plan? They can, they can be part of the plan. I think that that actually provides more tactical guidance of how do you implement right. these specific objectives, how you get to, to achieve these things. We all realize these, I think, are, are things that we do need to work, to work towards. You can kind of consider those major policy pro projects and programs, the, the roadmap or the tactical decisions that allow you to achieve those objectives. So we would like to see those actually included in the plan because it gives you a little bit more of a, a procedural direction on how to achieve yeah. those objectives. But if, if the commission doesn't want to see them, we can just focus on the specific objectives themselves. Well, I think that if, if the commission wants to include all of that into the plan, then we'll have to dive into all of that stuff and, and really discuss it in more more length. Yeah, if you were to do that. Yeah, and, and the, the key with the speed of the specific policy program, policy projects, and program recommendations is that they are have been tailored to be not overly prescriptive. And we're not trying to say we need to fund this particular initiative in this particular way. We're saying that this particular type of initiative is particularly valuable and it needs to be continued to be supported through whatever mechanism might be available to support it. In some cases, it might be the Office of Tourism offering some, some staff time to help make that recommendation that a reality. It might be the Division of Recreation putting staff time into making it reality. Um, in some cases, it might be additional legis legislative appropriations to actually stand up and move the program. So, well, and, and I think that's something that we all should be thinking about is what level of granularity and what types of things would we want to include in in the final plan. Um, so, yeah. So I, I think from our perspective, at a bare minimum, we would like to come to agreement and consensus on what these specific approaches are. Um, and if there's specific policies, projects, and programs that you, you think are no-brainers that we definitely need to include, we could and that's what makes it better specifically. All right, so I just wanted to be to be clear with what we're we're intending to get from the, the commission today is really working through all of these objectives. Um, but before we do that, I'm going to have uh, Casey jump through some of these specific policies uh, and, pro and project recommendations, policy projects, and program recommendations that came out of our comparative analysis and walk through those in individual detail. And then we'll jump back out to a, a bigger scale and walk through these objectives. What I'm really interested to hear what you might have learned from those spring workshops that you were able to participate in. We workshop these a lot with the, the hundreds of people that came for those workshops in the spring. We got a lot of feedback. They changed quite a bit. So they've not only been workshopped by, by you and the multiple versions that you've seen of them, they've also been workshopped by the hundreds of stakeholders who got to interact with uh, like we had presented to the uh, stake shop, the stake work stake stakeholders in the spring workshops. Uh, these really were meant to be living objectives, and now we finally got to them a point where we were able to bring them back to the commission and say, let's put a, a final stamp on these and call these. Good. I'll turn it over to Casey now, and she will present uh, the findings from the, the comparative analysis and the specific recommendations that come from that. Awesome. So I think a lot of you that have been on the commission for a while have seen my face at the workshops and in the meetings. I've always kind of been in the back, so fun to get to be in the front today. Um, but yeah, I am Dr. Smith, graduate student that's been working on the strategic planning process over the last year and a few months or so, kind of since it got started. And um, I spent a lot of time working on the comparative analysis, so he asked if I would 
share some of the recommendations that came out of it um, with you all today. So this is what the final version looks like. He did send you all a PDF digital version of it last week. So if you haven't got a chance to take a look at it, you can dig through your emails and, and find it. And it is um, published online as well now. And I think it's linked on the DOR website with the strategic plan um, information. So we did, sorry, this is a little blurry because it was from a screenshot, but the table of contents is a pretty good overview of the broad amount of topics that we covered in the plan. Um, and Dr. Smith did present on some of our preliminary findings, I think back in March when we had the first draft release. So we kind of just refined that first draft and then we did add a few new things. So we added a section with discussion on the different collaborative and coordinating mechanisms that we were able to identify throughout the study region, which is pretty awesome. And maybe I should clarify if you weren't here at the March, I think it was March meeting, the comparative analysis was meant to kind of look at how the states across the contiguous Western US manage outdoor recreation resources. So really kind of the state level involvement and management. And that was what this report was focused on detailing. Um, but because collaboration and coordination has emerged as an important theme in the strategic plan, we added some discussion on innovative structures that we identified in other states. So I can cover that a little bit today. I'm not gonna get into all the detail and minutia of the report because only some of the information that we gathered ended up informing recommendations. So we'll just kind of be walking through the recommendations that we include in the report and the data that went into informing those. So the first policy recommendation in the report is to expand the development and dissemination of responsible recreation education campaigns. And what we found in our research was that the offices of tourism all across this region are really good at curating awesome responsible recreation information. So Utah's um, Visit Utah website has some great content on how to you know, travel and recreate responsibly. Colorado you know, has its own kind of slogan and campaign for it. Idaho, similar, has a Travel with Care campaign and they have great online resources on the travel websites. And we did find some good content on all of the travel websites throughout this region. But what's underlying this recommendation is that for, you know, really providing someone information when they're trip planning isn't sufficient to change their behavior by the time they actually get on the trail and are hiking. So we need to, you know, further the dissemination of this content. And there has been some really excellent content created by the Office of Tourism and Vicky's team on this. Just kind of take it from their team to the other agencies that are managing and supporting outdoor recreation. Um, and we also recommend in our discussion of this, how to implement this recommendation is having some coordination or collaboration amongst all the agencies that are gonna be interacting with potential recreators or with recreators at some point working together to develop consistent messaging, determine what are the key things that we wanna emphasize. And so that people are gonna be seeing the same message and same content from when they're trip planning to when they're actually talking to a ranger at a trailhead, right? Or when they're looking at information at a trailhead board, having the same messaging um, would be really beneficial and getting people to remember what they read when they were planning their trip to Utah three months ago. <laughs> and obviously you're also gonna be missing the folks that are locals and don't necessarily look at the Visit Utah website to figure out what they're gonna do. So that's really underlying this recommendation. Are there any thoughts or questions? On this? Yeah. Yeah. So, so when you're saying that, that we need to be giving the same messaging, are you suggesting that UOT and DOR get a little more aligned in that messaging? Yes, that's a great way to rephrase it. And also, considering you know federal partners, counties, and municipalities that are managing recre recreation resources and are actually putting information on trailheads. So the research has shown that providing people this education is really effective. But the timing is important to consider, especially depending on the behavior that you're trying to change. So if you're trying to encourage someone to bring a camp stove, so they don't have to use a campfire to cook food, so they don't have to make a fire at all, right? Maybe you have fire restrictions, or it's just a lower impact practice to not have a campfire, right? You need to tell them when they're thinking about the food they're gonna bring on their trip. So you can't tell them when they roll up at their campsite and they brought hot dogs to roast over the fire don't do a fire, right? So some information is better in advance, which is great for the trip planning phase, but some information, like you should really stay on trail, is gonna be better if they're told right at the beginning of their hike, especially let's say maybe in Southern Utah, you're trying to teach people about cryptobiotic soil and to avoid walking on it. 
it's going to help if you actually tuck someone on the trail or at the trailhead and say, look, this is what cryptobiotic soil looks like. Try to avoid walking on that. If they read about it two months ago, they're probably going to forget or maybe not recognize what it looks like when they're actually out. Does that kind of help? Yeah. I, yeah. Cool. Uh, Casey? Go ahead. <laughs> well, I, I just want to elaborate a little bit on what I think I hear you saying to see if we are all concurring around this. Um, I like your recommendation. I think it makes sense. I think this is our area of talent, is mm -hmm. high level branding, communication. Yes, and um, and we're very invested in doing this well. And so what I would imagine um, as action steps, did you put action steps in there? Or, we didn't, but. Okay, but so let yeah. me just rehearse yeah. a few ideas of action steps to see if it's consistent with the way other people see it, but which would be that it, there would probably be a working group convened from all the respective organizations where we would go through a thoughtful process of defining perhaps a high level brand that everything would go under potentially the forever mighty that our office has led out on or you know that could be iterated through the working group and, and perhaps some high level messages so that there is a a sense among residents and visitors alike that uh, we're all invested in Utah in um, thoughtful, responsible recreation planning. And then there would be uh, probably tiered communications depending on the type of um, water sport or uh, biking or whatever that, that would follow under that. And it would be universal messaging that would go to visitors and residents alike. Is this sort of the way everybody else is saying this? That yeah. would be amazing. Yeah. So, and, and I'll ask, yes, the answer is yes. We, we're definitely um, saying. In fact, I, I love it when two independent processes come together like this. We've been talking about this internally before this recommendation was given. Our office, DOR, um, we're, that's one of our key results that we've identified is that all people recreating outdoors in Utah are doing it responsibly. So this, this lines up perfectly, and we've been talking about the idea of a campaign. So we're on board with that. I like Vicky's idea of a working group. You could almost do sort of like co-branding. I mean, trust on administration is a very large landowner, and we want to try to distinguish ourselves from BLM or others because we have a different mandate. And so having our logo on a sign that's also, if we could do like some some sort of co-branding, I think that'd be great. And obviously, we have to have a federal government involved. We'll do, I'm sure we yeah. yeah, there's a lot of, I think this might be given in a little bit more detail in the write-up of the report. But there's a lot of things that are good to have the consistent messaging across the board, right? But then you need to have some flexibility for regional or site-specific messages as well. So it is, there's a tactful way to, to do that. But awesome. I'm, and you, I'm so glad you articulated so well. If you want to, yeah, what we were envisioning as well. Yeah. Can, can I add a shameless plug here? But I think the key here is that we're expanding this to look at how we partner with private companies to get this messaging out, not just relying on DOR website or tourism website or even you know the Forest Service or National Park websites or whatever. Um, and I mean, that's the role I hold now is we reach 55 million people that are actively seeking and planning their trail activities. And the whole role or my program that we're doing is how can we get the messaging that Vicki wants, that Jason wants, that the Salt Lake Ranger District wants to those people that are using our platform? So I'm not, and, and, and of course, I'm just, I think All Trails is the best to do this, but I, I think the whole like private public partnership, because there's a lot of platforms, there's trail forks, there's people using certain platforms for whitewater, there's people, you know, camping, whatever it is, like using the messaging and being consistent through those private entities is key to actually reaching the people that you need to because you gotta get it where they're consuming the information. They may not be consuming it from a government website, they're consuming it from a private website. So I think that's essential. It would be a bad campaign. Yeah, yeah man. Yeah. Well, for local government, if you can pack, if you can have your consistent branded messaging that's pre-packaged <clears throat> city social media. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, where the communications kit that they can just Yeah, the kit that we can forward out because you know, local governments are smaller and people wear many more hats. And we just had an instance where we were trying, our trails committee was trying to make sure that we 
um, you know, had cute little memes that we could send out to remind people as we hit peak volume on trails to be better stewards. And the amount of time people went to trying to like find the rules for different things. Or finding the rules that they want. I think that's their thing. They'll search a website like, oh, this says I can't do it, but this site says I can. I'm following this website, right? So the consistency out, across yeah. it is, is If key. we put it out on a, on a government website, whether it's city or county, like it has to be the right rule, right? The amount of time we invested in trying to figure out what the rule for leashes on Forest Service trails was, was ridiculous. Because we wanted the right, the real answer, not just the answer we want. But if we have them all, then we can, we can make them in easy kits that would go out. Yeah. And is, and is there going to be any funding to help getting, like if you're talking about putting lots of signs, that's expensive to take one. So I'll throw that out there. Yeah. Cool. There's a lot of great discussion on this one, so maybe we'll come back to it later. But I'll continue and for the sake of time. So the second recommendation really kind of builds off of that first one, and it is um, to integrate program evaluation into outdoor recreation education programs. So this includes any mandatory trainings that the state has, right? So OHV, safety training, boating training, hunter safety, but also the recreation, um, like responsible recreation campaigns that are going out. And even things like aquatic invasive species um, education campaigns, which is another big one that is very common across the region. One thing that I was really surprised by, I, I think that I just had the assumption like education is awesome and it works super well. And so Jordan told me to look into some of the academic literature and find some sources for that. And it's actually really mixed or inconclusive on whether training requirements have any effect on changing people's behavior or increasing their ethics, particularly for like OHV, boating and hunter safety. And there just hasn't been a lot of research done on it, which surprised me. So just because you're creating the content doesn't mean it's having the intended effect. And the only way you can know if that's happening is by evaluating your program, right? And seeing if it is changing people's behavior. Um, there has been a ton of research done on the aquatic invasive species AIS education campaigns. And that's been a lot more promising. Um, it has been shown to be effective, but the evaluation of those programs has also shown where there's gaps and where it's not as effective. So maybe it's been really successful at changing voters' behavior and getting them to adopt their practices, but it's missing the mark on anglers and they don't realize that they're also supposed to be doing something to prevent the spread of AIS. So yeah, Tara. Yes, I, well, I've got a question just because we have a brand new staff member who is going to be taking on this kind of oh okay uh, cool you want to just like, introduce yourself <laughs> absolutely, absolutely yeah this whole time i'm like oh this is nice <laughs> uh yes my name is Deirdre miller um i am from higher ed i was at uvu the last five years um and i was with the utah women leadership project before that so working a lot of curriculum trainings and uh, education heavy background along with marketing communications so, so you're going to be taking on which role, what role with this as regards to that? Absolutely. I will be working with finding out messaging, with making sure it correlates with policy recommendations and what we want our stewards to know for the land management. So, and as I'm in the new role, we're definitely deciding how all of that will come into play, but very excited. And day yes, two, this is right? a big piece. Yeah, this is day two for me. <laughs> <laughs> so. Amazing. You all are ahead of the curve already thinking about the recommendations. Well, but the program evaluation will be needed as she's getting out yes. messaging and it would be great to coordinate yeah. with yes. uh, the tourism office. They Absolutely. they know their stuff, but you know your that area of expertise. So let's yeah, work for them together. That's why do y'all already have a Paltrics? Do we have a Paltrix? Yes. Yes, we do. Perfect. Wonderful. That's what I'm already thinking of. Awesome. So you're are you working towards it? <laughs> I, I love this. We, another thing we've been already talking about, and, and, and the anecdata that we've sort of been receiving about the, especially the OHV course, is very promising, but mm -hmm. it's just anecdotal. We've heard people feel like they've observed change. So to have actual data with mm -hmm. a good scientific evaluation would be really, really good. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, I mean, it really just provides an opportunity for improvement as well. So, like for the literature that we found that evaluated the AIS campaigns. They were able to realize like they were trying to get five things across and they realized people don't process five pieces of information at once you have to do three or less so they changed their campaigns right so so it just provides an opportunity for realizing where there's opportunity for improvement or where you're missing the mark and need to modify 
your message or your delivery um, so that it is going to be changing behavior in the way that you are trying to with your education. Any other thoughts? Cool. So the next recommendation um, is really about a potential future for the Outdoor Adventure Commission and your work moving forward after the strategic plan process wraps up. And so it is to extend the mission of the Outdoor Adventure Commission to include encouraging improved collaboration and coordination across the many agencies and organizations that develop and manage outdoor recreation opportunities within the state. And it's funny, I had kind of thought about, like, what does this look like in practice? I have thought about Vicki's example already of the working group of like what you could use this commission as an opportunity to do. So you could create a separate working group for the education. You could also use the time um, that you have allocated for these commission meetings to do that at a high level and then maybe establish a subcommittee that would kind of be the working group, but it would still be affiliated with this commission. And you could have the subcommittee, you know, reporting to this commission on what they've been working on, what they need to do, and the commission could be providing that higher level guidance if you were trying to take responsible recreation as a campaign that the OIC really wanted to champion and further in the state, right? Um, but we did identify some examples in a few other states in the region where they kind of have a similar coordinating, collaborating, high level state body um, that is kind of working to achieve these same goals within the state. So Wyoming um, has an interagency outdoor recreation team which the Wyoming's, off, Wyoming's Office of Outdoor Recreation is kind of championing, making it happen. Um, but it consists of them, their business council, Department of Transportation, Game and Fish Department, Office of State Lands and Investments, and Office of Tourism. So it sounds like a pretty similar representation to this board. Um, but according to their Office of Outdoor Recreation staff, that um, team meets throughout the year and works together to develop tools and partnerships and sees opportunities for synergy collaboration towards shared goals. And they also work with um, municipalities, state and federal agencies um, when it makes sense to achieve common goals. And they actually have um, produced some tangible products from their working together. So they created this thing called a wonder map, which is essentially an online database that shows all the different recreation opportunities in Wyoming. And it was kind of a partnership between their Office of Tourism and their Office of Outdoor Recreation. It's hosted on both of their websites. And I think that came out of their interagency team. So that just kind of provides an example of, you know, how a group like that can serve as a coordinating body. Again, I think Vicki, you articulated it super well is the potential with the working group, getting everyone together to talk about the responsible recreation messaging could be, you know, one thing, but you could extend that collaboration and coordination into other areas as well. And then Colorado has an entity called the Colorado Outdoor Partnership, which I believe is also legislatively mandated, at least like an executive order. And it has similar structure to the OAC where there's, you know, two conservation interests, two agriculture interests. Um, but they also include the Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management, and according to their uh, staff, they've tried to include the Park Service, but they're just really busy, <laughs> but they're still trying to get them on board. Um, but they meet regularly to talk about high-level policy goals and actually make and vote on policy recommendations that they think will be beneficial for conservation, outdoor recreation in the state. So it's kind of a similar entity that has diverse representation and is really high level. Um, they have the Outdoor Recreation Industry Office involved, Department of Natural Resources, uh, Parks and Wildlife, and then also the federal agencies involved. Um, so similar. But in order for this you know, recommendation to really be achieved, we kind of laid out some just things that people would need to come to agreement on understanding. So first, all of you as the members of the OAC, just understanding that that's your goal of being here, right? Is to think about how you can collaborate, coordinate, work together. Um, to make outdoor recreation better in the state. The research is very settled on the efficacy of having facilitators, trained facilitators uh, present to kind of help keep things going with any collaborative um, bodies or meetings. So having a dedicated personnel or trained facilitator to organize the meetings, get the agenda going. I'm sure DOR is aware of the amount of work that goes into just planning meetings, especially when you have this many people involved. So considering who can be your, you know, expert facilitator and, and keep things going. Um, and then again, I think that Dr. Smith mentioned this a few meetings back, but considering maybe the players for outdoor recreation that are currently missing from this room. So maybe the federal agencies, at least having them involved in an advisory role. So I think like for the outdoor partnership, they're not going to formally vote on policy recommendations. They can't do that in their agency role, but they're on that um, 
they're in that group as an advisory role so that they're still involved and can provide their input on any discussions or still be there to collaborate and work together with all the state entities that are involved. Um, another consideration could maybe be like Native American tribes or I don't know if there's any other interests. Um, any thoughts on this one or questions? It's kind of a more difficult one to conceptualize, I think. Yeah, Tara. Yeah, I, I like this a lot. And I will say that um, from the very beginning, the Office of Outdoor Recreation had had an Outdoor Recreation Advisory Committee. We never made it a board. Mm. We never made it um, anything official, so we wouldn't have to follow the Open and Public Meetings Act issues. But um, I think too, at the very beginning, there was this like, do we really let these outsiders advise, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the um, office then at the time? Mm -hmm. So, but so frankly, just to make it very clear, Colorado copy, but then they did make theirs a official board, which does provide direction to, to the division. Uh, Jason has revived that advisory committee, which does have mm -hmm. the federal partners okay. A more outdoor industry folks and, and others and bringing that back on a quarterly basis. I think this commission can do something bigger and uh, much more official just because of its, its ties to the legislature, which I don't think those other two things have. So um, mm -hmm. this is, uh, you know, with, within that and, and Jeff, uh, I would love to hear your um, your thoughts on this with that in mind. Uh, what what you're seeing, as, you know, as the future forward for this commission. So the original legislation that created this commission, mm -hmm. uh, I should know because I ran that. Um, yes, envisioned this to be a a short term commission with the mandate of creating this strategic plan. And then it was planned to sunset mm -hmm. after the strategic plan was done. Right. It was later legislation actually run by Representative Snyder that removed the sunset, made this a permanent commission and gave this commission additional responsibilities. One of those I think we're gonna start talking about at the, at the last part of our agenda was like prioritizing projects and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a, I think this is a good question is, okay, once the street, we sort of have a strategic plan in place, then what is really the role and pur purpose and function of this commission? And I think that, the, so I think this is a great discussion to have, decide exactly, okay, what, as, as we move from this phase of, of generating the, the strategic plan, then I think maybe it becomes more, you know, how are we now implementing some of these things? How are we, what are we doing to facilitate and coordinate and, and those kinds of things. Um, so I, I think it's a great discussion to have. Those those are some of my thoughts right now, um, and we can we can talk about the specifics as we go forward. Yeah, awesome. yeah. that's funny. You have to figure out now this now that you're in perpetuity. <laughs> right. What's next after this? Fight? So yeah, and, this was and, kind and of I will say also one that idea. I, I mean, there's always lots of advisory committees and boards, and they're just all over the place. And, 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 and I've run several bills that have created these things too. And there's a big effort to consolidate and streamline um, all of the boards and commissions. You know, there's over 400 boards and commissions in the state and they're, they're getting more scrutiny on, okay, is this really performing a valuable function? And even within the recreation space, I mean, I don't know how many advisory committees we have. We have a whole bunch. Well, but there's, there's like, the OHB committee, there's the UR grant committee, there's the voting, voting, uh, voting OHB. Um, oh, and RTP. Well, the RTP, RTP does, is, run, is done by. We, can, we consolidate it when we, 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 we take that division. Yeah. Because I've got another bill again, I'm getting ready for next year that we create another one. Don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but, but anyway, I would like to figure out how to create some efficiencies and how to consolidate some of these things too. So if there's some responsibilities that we could say, well, let, let's have the commission do that versus some of these other advice committees, I'd love to hear that. And I know the governor's office would be in favor. Oh, yes. As well. yeah. yeah, I got a call a couple of weeks ago about that very thing. Yeah. Asking about some voting advisory council, or the advisory council, wanting to consolidate yeah. and save that off. But and, and just from Jason's position, like, 
the same 10 people would also really appreciate that, right? Like, I mean, right. I know when you're in positions like Vicky's and Jason's and whatever, they, you end up serving on a lot of advisory committees for different yeah. things in the government that not always are the best use of time. Right. Well, and, and the other part is that the Utah Outdoor Recreation Grant Advisory Committee, they also, well, they also do the non-motorized uh, RTP approval, and they'll have the Utah Children's Outdoor Recreation Education Grant, although we're hoping to create a subcategory because there is a, we don't want to have too much work on, you know, these body. people who have limited time or we're going to burn them off, burn them out. And so there is some need to spread the work. And so that's my counterpoint to let's consolidate and put more work on fewer commissions and, and advisory committees. Uh, so, yes, I, I hate to keep saying we're already starting, but we're already starting. So like Tara said, we've stood that advisory council up again. They are simply advisory in nature. But I do see um, maybe a connection where they can work with this group on some level. I don't think they need to be in statute. I don't, I don't think that's a good idea at all. But it is well-rounded. People from wildlife, there are people from federal agencies, people from adaptive, various different aspects of outdoor recreation. And uh, we've only met once. We've got a meeting again later this month. I know we're quarterly, but at some point, yeah, it would be good to meet. And you could use Have them as a working group for mm -hmm. something that you'd yeah. like them to take on. Awesome. Yeah, the OAC will really, it's meant to be the board that would create policy recommendations, recommend funding of the outdoor adventure infrastructure restricted account, right? So it does have more direct connections with the legislature and maybe the advisory committee. So this next recommendation um, is really related to the bill that Representative Sanquist proposed, well, got passed this year, the Outdoor Recreation Initiative. How can that actually happen? Um, so the recommendation is to incentivize and facilitate the formation of regional outdoor recreation councils with statutory authority to develop region specific strategic outdoor recreation plans and advance high priority infrastructure development projects to the Outdoor Adventure Commission for consideration. So this could maybe be an alternate role for the Outdoor Adventure Commission, right, it would be kind of overseeing outdoor regional councils that are forwarding projects and kind of thinking about how to allocate funds in the most impactful way across different regions throughout the state. So we did chat with Tyler Thompson with Utah's Watershed Restoration Initiative, which I believe was kind of the model program for the ORI. We also identified um, similar programs again in Wyoming and Colorado. I think they've also been doing a lot of work on outdoor recreation. So Wyoming has an Outdoor Recreation Collaboratives Initiative which is run through their um, Office of Outdoor Recreation. There's actually seven of them, but they only created fancy logos for five. So I just threw those five on there. But there are two full-time and two part-time staff with their Office of Outdoor Recreation whose responsibility is to organize, facilitate, and make these collaborative groups happen. Um, and they kind of cover like one to three counties throughout the state. So they don't have full coverage of the state like the Watershed Restoration Initiative, um, but they are doing a lot of collaboration and coordination with the local um, land management agencies, county commissioners, I think are pretty involved on them. Um, just influential um, people in the community, like business owners are involved in these collaborative groups and they'll work on thinking about projects that are gonna be regionally significant and valuable to their region. And then Colorado has also the Colorado Outdoor Regional Partnerships Initiative, which is, um, which the Colorado Outdoor Partnership, which I just talked about, is the, I think, oversight body would be the right phrase for it, for that initiative. And so, again, they realized that they needed to get some stuff going on regionally. They had the co-op functioning at the state level, getting that collaboration, but they still needed more going on regionally. And there actually was a few great examples of regional collaborative groups related to conservation and outdoor recreation that exist in Colorado. So they created this program to try to incentivize more, but they kind of swept in those existing ones that had already been doing a lot of work into this and there are 14 of them throughout Colorado. They only have one staff member that kind of helps facilitate and coordinate the work of the co-op, that state level board, but they are hiring another staff person to facilitate and help oversee the regional partnerships initiative. And they offer a lot of grant funding to incentivize the formation of these groups and to help them be successful. So they have a, a grant through their governor's office that's 25 to $150,000 just for these groups to hire facilitators 
and to convene. So to get a meeting space, food, to get people together. So it, it does cost a lot of money to even just get people in the same room, it turns out. Um, so they are still also putting a lot of resources into it. And then for the WRI, um, obviously there's Tyler's position as the statewide coordinator that's making the WRI happen every year, but he also gets a ton of help from the Division of Wildlife Resources in running the program. And they, he told us that they estimated a few years ago that it costs about a million dollars in administrative support to run the WRI program each year. I think the state legislature puts in about 6 million towards the projects each year. So it's like a one to six ratio of the administration to actually running the program. Obviously they are able to leverage a ton of matching funds from federal partners, um, private companies or individuals, nonprofit groups as well through that program. But just some consideration of the amount of resources that go into making these programs happen. And then Dr. Smith puts just ask, oh yeah, and I'm sure this is in the detail that we need to sort, but do you imagine this being uh, some sort of matching local and state matching grants or? We don't, I mean, it's yeah. very, it's like, we do have some clear, like a roadmap for how you might implement this program, but not that specific. So one option could be, right, like doing the Colorado approach where you have a grant program that's just because you want these groups to form and be successful. And it does take a lot of time up front, getting people together, building trust, all of these um, regional groups with all these programs, they have to establish charters. They have to decide how are we gonna come to consensus on topics? How are we gonna vote? How are we gonna establish ground rules so that this is a productive? Obviously, um, some topics can be a little contentious. <laughs> so they have to you know, take time relationship building, building trust, establishing charters, ground rules for how they're gonna convene. And that does take more time than I think people expect. But so one option could be, right, providing grants like Colorado to try to incentivize these groups forming. Um, or Wyoming, right, is basically doing it through their staff power and staff time by having two full-time and two part-time staff basically run these seven collaboratives. They do try to make it very grassroots by having, you know, a local community leader really spearheading, but they're the ones that are sending out the emails, making sure the agenda is ready, finding the meeting space. It does take a lot of kind of underappreciated behind the scenes work <laughs> to get people together. Um, question, because I know that the the GoCo fund, the big $65 million of funding for outdoor recreation that comes from their lottery, that one, I know that it's, it's set up regionally that all those regions will send for their final candidates for these grants. Is that part of any of this? This is, that's different. Yeah, so it's, it is pretty confused. I think I don't know much about the regional GoCo funds. Obviously, I'm familiar it's with not the government. It's like pseudo, but yet yeah, yeah. every one the of great them has Colorado. They yeah. have a legislator. Um, they have a, a few legislators on each of those. I think one has to be a Republican, one has to be a Democrat. I don't know. On the grant allocation. On yeah. each region, for each region. Yeah. Yeah, because with that, basically, they're the entity that administers half, about half of the lottery funds in Colorado. Uh -huh. To conservation and recreation projects, um, and it's a different entity than the Colorado Outdoor Partnership. It's in a right. different funding stream than the funding that's going yeah, to these regional partnerships. Just like, oh, top grants, yeah, they will always. Yeah, it's like, yeah, a few million here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, hey, hey, I was curious. Did you in this part? Did you think about things that we could already use, like the MPOs? The AOGs. Yeah, yeah. That. yeah, so that would be a big consideration. So the way that WRI works, don't have a map of it, but they just said we're going to align with the DWR regions, right? So it has full state coverage, and that's kind of a differentiation with Wyoming and Colorado, um, where instead they just tried to form groups where there was local momentum and interest to do that. And so those are different models. You can do both. Um, I'm not sure, though, if artificially creating boundaries could create problems with getting people together. So you'd have to be pretty strategic if you wanted to do the, you know, WRI approach, like does this delineation actually make sense for this region? So you just kind of take different approaches. When I talked to the coordinator for the COP about Colorado about it, she said, I think that if there wasn't already the regional groups that existed, that we just wanted to roll into this program, we might've just drawn lines on a map to decide where these regional groups were going to be. But because those groups existed, we didn't want to overrule them. We wanted to let them keep doing the great work they were. So we just rolled them in and tried to create incentives for more groups to form. 
and they hired that new coordinator position to try to get momentum going in the other parts of the state that don't have groups currently. Because we had that overlap with active transportation plans that are being um, planned at the local level, but but through your MPO. And if you're in that MPO, if, yeah, because yeah. remember, the MPOs don't cover a large portion of the state. If the DOGs do, yeah. the DOGs do. And that yeah, makes the exist as a structure. They're regional, the AOGs. Yeah. 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 And some of them are, already are doing a lot yeah. about the recreational tourism stuff. I think this would be a matter of forming a little bit of a structure for them to sort of follow a template for them to, to use as to kind of officially. There are, there are a lot of regional and local like user groups, you know, trails foundations and things like yeah. that. That I want, but, but they could be just, they could just have a seat at the table at that. Yeah, I was, I was gonna say you don't want to push aside any of the nonprofit or advocacy groups right. that are doing the great work in the areas. But yeah. Yeah, the AOG, the if table. the AOG becomes the convening of those those partners at the table, if you say that, that would be key, right? You don't want to you don't want to burden also like local officials and the AOGs to take on more either, and they're not the right representatives for this. And, and a lot of the AOGs are, I mean, some of the some of them are. Pretty thinly staffed and budget, like, like the six county. Six, I mean, there's six counties and there's what's the other five one? Five county. Five county. Yeah, really five creative five names. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's just, just not like the like, Big Twelve and the Big Ten that have like the wrong number of members. Yeah, the wrong number. <laughs> but those cover huge swaths of some really critical uh, outdoor recreation areas, but they're also very sparsely populated. But they're also they're kind of the only thing that exists, I guess, regionally. Convene would be those when you get closer from the Wasatch Front, it's much more dense, and you maybe need to break them into individual counties. Yeah, it might be the north and south. But, but that's, what that's what I'm saying. In those, in those more rural areas, you know, there's groups that are working in there that also represent, you know, whether it's a nonprofit or a or a, a committee or something like that, or a mountain bike group or, or something. An OHV group, like they're going to represent the recreation of that area where EOG, you know, covering this huge piece of BLM land, you know, might have different opinions on recreation in that space. So it's good to have the representation across all of the BLM. Of the yeah, there's a lot to balance, and my intuition is that there's pros and cons to both approach, right? With the WRI, you know that you're covering the entire state, but just because you say that there's a group there, is there really, you know? Like it might not be considering the more rural counties if there's you know some voices that are dominating in the discussions with those groups versus here you're you're missing you're for sure missing a lot of the state right but you know that all those groups are going to be a lot more active um, so it would have to take some research and seeing what makes the most sense for Utah but Dr. Smith made this diagram which is a pretty good illustration of kind of how the OAC could be kind of the oversight body for a regional council's initiative. So right, you have the OAC, the different recreation councils, you're probably gonna want at least one coordinator person to make sure like kind of the Tyler um, for the ORI, make sure the program's happening, everything's going well. But a future for these recreation councils could be that they maybe work on developing region specific plans or high priority projects that are inherently collaborative. One thing I think that's cool about the WRI that Tyler was telling me was that he requires any project proposals coming up through it, have at least like I think two or three different entities represented on that project proposal. So those projects have to be collaborative and have to be you know, impactful and desirable to multiple stakeholders um, that are proposing it. But then those projects get proposed right to the OAC for consideration for the Outdoor Adventure Infrastructure Restricted Account funding that you all are responsible for recommending to the legislature. So that could be kind of one potential vision for it. Um, but these, you know, even though I kind of talked about the administrative support that goes into making that would go into making a program like this possible. It's still a recommendation because what we've seen is that it's worth it, right? The outcomes that you get are awesome with just getting people together in the same room, building those relationships, increasing the coordination and collaboration among all the involved stakeholders. And then the projects that you would probably get proposed out of that, a more collaborative process, are going to be a lot more impactful than maybe one off pet projects <laughs> if someone's just able to write a grant. We'll just jump in there and say that one of the big points of leverage that we see with the idea of regional coordinating accounts is tying into the outdoor adventure infrastructure restricted account is that 
is that the, the OAC and that infrastructure issue that we got really serves as, as a huge carrot that those regional councils can be motivated to, to work towards putting putting funding applications into. Mm -hmm. So that's something that's very different than, than the other Western states that are really just organized just for the sake of organizing and developing plans. Uh, Utah is different and primarily because of the outdoor adventure infrastructure issue that we have, which really provides uh, a lot of that external motivation for convening these groups that might not already want to convene. So that's that's a big point of uh, the trying to connect the outdoor adventure the infrastructure restriction account and the actions of the OAC with more regional working groups on the ground. Yes, and yeah, having an incentive for people to come together, which would be the OA IRA funding, right? Um, has been shown to be super impactful in making sure that these groups are actually successful. <laughs> Cool. Can I, so, sorry, yeah. can I interrupt for a second? Yeah. <laughs> I want to ask Vicki a question. Do you have regional advisory groups that support tourism? How do you determine regional promotion? Um, we have, um, by statute, our board members represent regions of the state, mm -hmm. and we ask them to engage to understand the priorities of the region. We actually have new board members coming in this month, and and we're pushing them to do even more regional engagement than they have because it's been sort of hit and miss uh, when you say Jordan from your experience that some of them engage deeply, others not so much. Okay. So so like every but every region county has their own tourism organization, yes. right? And so yes. do they yeah. roll up to you or do they are they just kind of operating independently and then just um, they like us uh, because we give them co-op grants and because we create an overall marketing strategy, but they don't have any direct reporting to us. I mean, we have a very collaborative relationship, but we don't have any authority over the DMOs. The other thing that they can hear is, is the same as the, as the yeah. way that the, the counties operate with the, the DMOs. can be a very similar model because they really depend upon uh -huh. the, the county co-op funding that goes out in a similar way that the, the regional councils can be very dependent upon other adventure infrastructure restricted accounts like account funds that they can apply for. So the administrative structure is very similar, even though right. in tourism it works at the county level, a direct might work at the regional level. Exactly. Because if, if there's something that I would like to have happen more, it would be regional collaboration um, on our marketing strategies. And so I think this, uh, starting this off as a regional, some sort of a regional organization works really well. Do you have regions that can be neatly divided up as you look at the tourism side of things, because sometimes outdoor recreation and tourism are pretty joined at the hip. So, yeah, I mean, is it many, many years ago, there were different regions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so I think we can intuitively talk about regions. Mm -hmm. um, but I, if the, the Association of Governments model is an interesting one because it already exists. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but so, it, but it doesn't match the well recreation. the recreation yeah. politics of right. some of the things, uh -huh. right? Like you have an association of governments that's over whatever it is with five, six county that's over. It's got Moab as a pocket, but it's got this other, you know, like yeah. that causes definite conflicts on like planning just because of the politics of the certain. And so that's where like association of governments yeah. works well in some cases, but in other cases around the state, right? Like. It, it's, it's a potential, you know, dumpster fire to get some people in the room to, to, to try to work out a problem. Well, you got like Salt Lake County and, and Summit County. Yeah. yeah. There's just so much. There's so much difference there in the yeah. recreation styles and the groups yeah. and, the, and, the, and the vision and mission of what they want for tourism and recreation versus, you know, that, that, that's where I'm not saying either way, either way is right. I'm just saying like, if you want to get something done and not stalemate, you got to be really strategic on how we yeah well and i think like the, the aog model is a good one just because it's there so it's that there. might be like the easy way to go but it's not perfect uh -huh. certainly yeah. I mean, it's got some downsides but otherwise we're gonna have to, we'd have to like kind of reinvent that wheel 
Which is also a mess. Which I think yeah. 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 This is worth some thought and care yeah. to figure out. Yeah. Because I think if we get this right, it there are lots of uh, great ripples that can come from it. I mean, for example, if uh, if we get our regions thinking more collaboratively about money coming their way for regional uh, trail infrastructure and everything, that lays the groundwork for them to think more collaboratively, which I'm always trying to get them to do around their marketing. Because uh, the, the funding of GMOs is, uh, uh, causes people to think too narrowly about uh, recruiting visitors to their county, when in fact, no visitor is ever saying, oh, I really want to go to Grand County. Yeah. <laughs> so so this could guide a lot of, uh, like, yeah, very interesting, productive. Yeah, great suggestion. And there is a lot to count. So, might you have some? <laughs> yeah, Darren had a good she has them. Like, oh yeah. <laughs> I know why you like me, Darren. <laughs> AOGs don't always align for AOG level projects. We have outliers. Yeah. yeah. It'd be a dumpster fire and recreation. Ooh, it's sounds like there. Pitt and yeah. Darren are the same page. <laughs> um, so I might need some more consideration. Yeah, yeah it's um, like you said, we have to put a lot of thought. More, more thought that we can do here today. Right. I think it was there for that. Okay, I'll try to run quickly through the last recommendation that was in the comparative analysis is um, really about planning. So it is expand the statewide planning assistance program by considering alternate forms of planning support, such as partnerships with cooperative extension programs and or providing grant funding for local or regional governments to hire consultants to assist with comprehensive outdoor recreation planning. So I want to start this one by just saying Utah is awesome and unique in having Carly's position, a statewide planner and having a planning assistance program. I, at least I didn't find any other states in this region that actually have a position for that with their outdoor recreation office or entity, um, which is really awesome. However, we did find some examples in the region of other programs that seem to be doing pretty well. So Washington's Recreation and Conservation Office, which manages a lot of their recreation and conservation grants, has a planning assistance grant program, which provides money to communities for planning. Um, and actually all of their other grants that are for projects require that projects are tied to an existing plan, like a mini scorp that's going on. And so they say, you can't have a project funding unless you have a plan. And because that could be a barrier, we'll give you money to plan. Um, and then New Mexico's Outdoor Recreation Division hired a consultant to help make strategic plans for their regions throughout the state to kind of provide some direction and strategy for how they want to invest regionally. Colorado, again, with that Colorado Outdoor Partnerships, <laughs> Um, regional partnerships program. They have another grant that's, I think, just for those regional partnerships that will provide fifty to two hundred fifty thousand dollars for them just for planning. So they're really emphasizing the planning, and then I think seeing that the projects will be a secondary outcome of having that relationship, capital, and planning. Um, and so that can be for like community engagement, going into making a plan, collecting data, hiring a consultant to just help with the planning process, and then, as Tara mentioned, the Great Outdoors Colorado, that agency, that entity that administers some of the lottery funds has a separate planning program that I think like non, even nonprofit state entities, municipalities and counties can apply to get planning assistance. Um, so I think underlying this recommendation is an acknowledgement of even though Utah is awesome and having the planner position, Carly probably can't write a plan for every community in the state that needs it. Just kind of considering, considering other ways that you can provide that planning support to communities where really, you know, a lot of the rural communities, they just don't have the capacity um, to create, you know, good outdoor recreation plans. So thinking about alternative ways that you can help them do that is what's underlying this recommendation. Any thoughts? Yeah, and, and it's just, you know, speaking of, for Carly, and she can answer this too, but, you know, she had some demand for her services and it's increasing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this can, you know, there, there can be some capacity issue where you could add one more staffer but i do think that that's also needed is this opportunity to do this and if you tie this planning assistance program to the objectives of the outdoor adventure commission and the objectives for the outdoor adventure infrastructure restricted account then then we can have this alignment and that's you know 
of what is going to be, you know, regional significance, what's going to really be um, a legacy project. And uh, I, I think that this is a great opportunity. And uh, that's the whole reason her position was created in the first place is because these smaller counties and communities would never be able to afford having somebody like her on their staff. Yeah, and the planning is super important for informing where you're gonna get your best bang for your buck for project investment as well, right? So those are all the recommendations. Um, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah. I, was, I was just gonna sorry. we, um, <laughs> as UDOT, do have a technical planning assistance program that I know is really highly utilized. I honestly don't know a ton about it, but I just Googled UDOT planning. <laughs> I actually found it on our website. But um, yes, UDOT offers funding for technical planning assistance to local governments, especially to those experiencing rapid growth or lack sufficient resources to carry out planning and they're awarded on a competitive basis. And that and so. is a wonderful grant. I did a project when I worked for Cash County using that funding and we were able to do uh, trail feasibility uh, mm -hmm. work, which is great, but there's a big emphasis on the transportation and land use. So yep. it couldn't necessarily fund just the recreation plans that, so there's still a gap, but it is an awesome. Carly, how does really something to model on? <laughs> how, how does that work potentially? The you, you get the grant and then you're just hiring a contractor to well, and um, there could be a, w a way to provide some guardrails and kind of assistance for some of the communities because in some instances, unfortunately, communities can be taken advantage of by consultants um, where they don't really get a good deliverable out and they charge them, you know, a, a high price. So kind of being able to, to help guide and support some of those plans could be a potential way for this position in the DOR to, to be involved um, mm -hmm. in providing that grant. Funding. Municipalities use grants like this a lot, and they and they need them. Um, like my city has one right now to do redo our our general plan. The legislature requires we redo our general plan once a decade. It's a really robust effort for our planning department, and we don't you know plus all the stuff they're supposed to do in processing permits. So we need. Are you using to hire we, staff? We need to hire a consultant to help us, yeah. overseen by our our planning department staff. Yeah. But we had a similar grant to help us do our trails master plan. And I've, I've been talking to both North Salt Lake and Centerville, um, who are smaller cities than Bountiful, and they don't have a robust enough planning or park staff to start doing the planning to, to get a grant to do the planning to and get a grant to build anything with your, with your grant. They, they are, they're several steps removed because they're, they're city staffs even though you might not think of them as small, like something in Paiute or Wayne County, they're just there's just too many things on the to-do list for a planning department with, no offense, all the stuff, like moderate income right. housing plans <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and other things that, that, from a land use perspective, where you have to do as a municipality or a county. So, to, to, you know, you don't need it to hire staff so much, but you do need to hire a consultant, but you want to put guard over the consultant, but you need to have you know, either your city or your county staff will oversee that process. So you get the community engagement, you know, those things, and then you're eligible to start applying for a whole lot of other things, but not until you do. We, we see that with the UR process because we would see, I think, the county applying for it, but the it's an engineering firm that's doing all the work to put together the plan and the application and everything else for the county, right? Just because county, it's a small county that didn't have the resources to. I have a question together. That actually prompted a question in my mind. Carly, how deep do you go on planning? Do you do NEPA? Uh, so we'll do a lot of the visioning work. So a lot of the communities want it. They want it. Well, every community is different, I should say. In some communities, they don't know what they want. And so we survey the community, do public open houses, and say, what, what's the vision? And help with a kind of a conceptual plan. And in that process, you do stakeholder engagement. So for instance, in Bicknell, we'll, we're working with the BLM and they're saying, okay, well, kind of just a precursory, I can tell you that this is going to raise flag with our botanist. This is going to be this kind of need, et cetera. And so we don't get into the needs of we NEPA, but the weeds of NEPA, um, but we can identify where some of those hangups might be, where, you know, they're going to need to be proactive to navigate that process before they can build something. 
So until you have somebody who maps the trails, who's 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 out there mapping the trails, so you've done your high level plan, you know, with your stakeholders, and this is the regions, and here's the source trail that we go, and then you actually have to send someone out into the field that is there, GPS, you know, following the contours, mapping it. That's what the, you're then going to submit when you're ready for that NEPA process. So my, I guess my question is, if we're, if we're providing grants to facilitate that work, if the county, if the county or a city council is do the NEPA process, or is it going to do the NEPA process? Are we wasting time? That's why, yeah, I, Tara and I have been kicking around a lot how it would be really great to provide some of the, the funding for the consultant work for that planning process, but then saying, okay, what's your top one, two, three projects? Narrow it down to one and then use some funding to help go out and do some of the surveying to move you further along on the NEPA. Um, just really kind of look at it holistically as opposed to not just a plan that sits there, but a plan that has teeth and is moving through that environmental process yeah, in theory. If we could do that, like, you know, facilitate even just creating that NEPA and all that kind of stuff, getting that through that NEPA process, streamlining that. Um, would be very helpful because otherwise it's just, you know, you get bogged down with the red tape, you know, it's anything screwed. you can do to like push, yeah. push through that red tape. The other thing I was going to mention too is it's great to have this kind of resources available for planning and all these grants that are available. Then I'm also hearing from a lot of these rural counties that they can't even apply for the grants because they don't have a grant writer. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so some we're yeah, helping the resources really, with grant writers. Really. We need, we need, I mean, they, yeah, they need a consultant that's going to do everything kind of soup to nuts, right? Like, right. even writing the grant, I think. The plan. <laughs> yeah. And then yeah, having engineers on staff to do like NEPA and everything else. And like, it's a lot of them outsource it to engineering firms. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I think in the evaluation of, of a grant application, we should know whether or not they have an engineering firm available to them and the funds to go through the process. Otherwise, well, and what's what's the cost? Like, what's the going rate of a sit for a consultant to do this type of process? Because that's the other thing. Like, we're going to provide grants if these grants become five hundred thousand dollar grants. Like, I might. Yeah. I think this is really great discussion. I feel bad yeah. though because Dr. Smith was going to try to do discussion be... on the. But it's exciting. It is. <laughs> yeah. No, it's great. I think this is indication that there might need to be an entire meeting to talk about the different recommendations, right? And how we could make them happen. And again, that could be the future of the OAC is figuring out how to actually implement these recommendations. Um, Commissioner Bushman is basically <laughs> saying we should keep it simple. Yeah. 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 But with that, I'll say all the recommendations that I went through went through obviously tie in super well to the strategic plan cardinal directions. I'm gonna hand it back over for the discussion specifically on the directions and objectives. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Casey. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty lucky to work with some spectacular graduates. Um, I wanted to jump now. Do we need to take a break to get Josh? I, we, we snuck out. Oh, we snuck out? Yeah. Okay, you're official now. So if we vote in you're good. <laughs> um, so I wanted to spend the rest of the time that we have uh, walking through these specific objectives, seeing if, if there's any points of contention that commissioners might have. Uh, I think that our vision for these cardinal directions and objectives, you have them in front of you, you can kind of interpret the, the cardinal directions as what we want to achieve collectively as a, as a state, what are the, the real strategic directions that are going to move after recreation forward. The specific objectives are, are why we want to move there, where, where are there threats that came up in local workshops, where are there, there big issues that need to be addressed, and where is, is there a lot of opportunity? So, uh, so the cardinal directions are what the specific objectives are why, and then the major policies, projects, and programs are really how. There are the tactical steps that you can take to, to work back towards those objectives. So if you want to interpret those, um, that's probably the easiest way to do it. What you want to achieve, why you want to achieve it, and then the tactical guidance on and how you want to achieve it. These tactical steps can be taken by the Outdoor Adventure Commission as a whole. Some of them might be better to be taken up by an individual agency, and some of them might be better to be pushed down to a regional council or, or a working group of the Outdoor Adventure Commission. Um, just to give people that 
maybe are not familiar with the process that we have gone through to develop these specific objectives. We developed an uh, initial list after our fall workshop, seven, uh, fall, seven fall workshops. And then we presented those back to all the stakeholders that came to our spring workshop series. And, and we basically asked them a very general question of, do these cardinal directions and the specific objectives as they're presented to you, do they align with the specific needs of the Six County region or the Mountain Ryan region or the Bear River region? Uh, and they give us feedback and worked in groups. We had Jake Powell, who is on our research team. Uh, he's online today. He facilitated the discussion of groups, small groups, about seven or eight. And we had each of those groups identify major concerns that they might have, maybe specific wording issues. There was, there was quite a few little wording issues that people had. And then we recorded all of those, those notes and those suggested revisions. And in, 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 total, or in total, after we did all seven workshops in the spring, we had about 235, 236 group comments. And those were comments that the stakeholders uh, collectively as a group of seven or eight working at a table uh, could generally agree on that they needed to be changed. And we took all that advice and then we, we came back to the list of objectives and made those, those necessary changes. And, and some things have changed a little bit more substantively, but there's been also been a, quite a few of subtle comments. But what you see, in front of you now is really is that refined version of the objectives and their cardinal direction. But we would like to propose to move forward as the final objective of the outdoor recreation strategic plan. What actually gets written in the plan and how we can then build out the narrative for each of those specific objectives will depend upon the availability of data that we have to, to support it. A lot of these specific objectives, there's, there's data and resources to really make it very clear that it is an objective, a critical need for the state. And, and others, it's just a, a general sense that we've got uh, across the number, across the workshops that we participate. Um, so some of the things that did change, particularly walking through the, the specific cardinal directions, um, the first two stayed the same. There was general agreement need to build and support collaborative partnerships. Uh, there was a general consensus. There was a need to improve awareness and education about responsible recreation. Not much moved in, in those two specific cardinal directions. Um, increasing access to outdoor recreation while protecting natural and scenic landscapes. Some flat subtle change here. There was some concern over the initial language which we had written into, which was described as, as conserving natural landscapes, the idea of conservation. Uh, could have been construed by some of the workshop participants in a, a slightly um, negative way, or a, it could have been it could have been misinterpreted. So we use protecting instead, um, and also we also used the, the broader terminology of increasing access. We had previously had a, a more wordy description of of increasing the outdoor, outdoor recreation opportunity where there is demand, uh, but increasing access generally across the board is a little bit more. We did get that feedback, particularly from the rural portions of the state, where we, we don't want this just to have demand in areas where, or build infrastructure where, where there is a lot of demand. We also realize there's a lot of areas of the state that might not have infrastructure in place that we can put that infrastructure in place. So increasing access includes putting infrastructure in place where it also needs, where it meets an existing demand, and it also means putting infrastructure in place where it might meet a future demand. It also includes putting resources into making parks in protected areas and trails more accessible in areas where they, there's a lot of people, but there's just not a lot of outdoor recreation activities, primarily along the Wasatch Front, in particular communities along the Wasatch Front. Um, and the last one didn't change as change much as well. So increasing the economic and health benefits generally from outdoor recreation. So general feelings amongst the group, amongst the commissioners, after you participated in the workshops, is there any points of concern, points of uh, questioning on these specific cardinal directions? Just, just, just only one. And, and the reason I bring it up, well, a couple of reasons, but I, I really like, first of all, I like it. I think they really reflect pretty well what we've already been talking about in the division. Um, in fact, as I mentioned a while ago, our, our, our key results that we've identified, what we really want to have as our kind of our pillars. We want to minimize the number of search and rescues, we want to maximize the number of people getting out and enjoying outdoor recreation, and we want to make sure that they're doing uh, it responsibly. So the one, the one word that I would ask to be added 
or, or concept is, is about safe outdoor recreation. So I don't think safety, public safety is, is addressed in any of the four, but I think it would work very well in the one in the upper right, improve awareness and education about safe, comma, responsible recreation. I think because great. it feeds really well into the actual objective that is at the cross from it, decrease the need for search and rescue. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Uh, yeah. Responsible recreation is not necessarily going to um, decrease them. the possibilities of, of being in a SAR, but safe educa education about how to, how to stay safe and how to be prepared is going to, to definitely do that. Okay. Any other, other comments? Do these align with the. I, I like it. I like that comment. I think that's it. That really good. Ricky, yeah. Yeah, uh, and then something else that we've sort of touched on, but I realize maybe we haven't reached consensus around is that don't don't we want to show leadership to figure out uh how to um take care of people who find themselves in trouble um you know right now i think we're all frustrated by um, the statewide fund that's too modest and um yeah, TRT that's too stretched and um, sort of a, a broad recognition that we want to be national leaders as an outdoor recreation economy and so we have to have some sort of a mitigation fund to take care of people who get themselves in trouble. Yeah, that's the number one thing I hear about talking in rural Utah is demand on search and rescue and it's disproportionate and there's got to be a way to, to bring some proportionality. So, I'm from the Utah yeah. Sheriff's Association, and I can tell you that the impact in search and rescue is significant, and they get stuck with the bill that that fund is depleted, and it doesn't work for rural counties who don't have big sources of income. That is a huge part of, I think, what we need to look at here is how do we better fund, better educate people to be safe so they don't need search and rescue, but how do we better yeah. fund search and rescue? Because that happens every holiday. It's right. just overwhelming. And I think. Uh, we're on a really good path on the education part of it, but that we need to create somewhere in here a mitigation fund, the, the, the responsibility to figure out the mitigation for when things go wrong. And, and that might be a specific policy recommendation or uh, fall within that, fall under that objective of reducing the need for search and rescue. Um, but I think I think that is is captured well within that. Improving awareness and education about responsible recreation it is the, the ultimate objective of that is to reduce the demand of search and rescue. It, it might be there, there also is a need for for supply of, of funding to actually meet that need where it is being uh, experienced. Um, so do we feel that 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 is general enough that awareness that about education, safe and responsible education? would cover not only mitigation, but also more proactive funding like, like Vicky's talking about. I'll, I'll chime in um, because I, I agree. I think I'm hearing that there's there are both parts of that. We want to, that improving education and awareness about safe responsible recreation helps reduce the demand, but then there's always going to be demand. And so there needs to be funding for that. and. Um, so I think that the funding side needs to be like a, an objective of project. Um, I don't know that I would necessarily put it into the wording of these high level kernel groups, but, but it, the point is very well taken. And as a matter of fact, I'm working on multiple pieces of legislation to address that this, this upcoming session. So, so maybe it's something uh, like I can see where it could uh, fit under the first uh, bullet of the build and support property processes where we might add yeah. in yeah. Um, the, the mitigation um, for safety yeah. problems. Yeah, and in fact, there's um, one of these says, um, when was it? Um, ensuring the, I was on here, I want to see infrastructure development where, where, where it's happening. And, and needs, yeah, yeah meeting, meeting local needs. And so, and I'm, I've also kind of been educated because I've been using the term recreation mitigation. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think from a branding PR perspective, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm starting to be corrected to say like 
visitor management. I'm turning that from the tourist <laughs> view. Let's call it visitor management. Well, and prevent that search and rescue too. Yeah, yeah. Well, sure. and I, I would argue for recreation management. Recreation, it's all of us. Recreation it's not just visitor management. Yeah, recreation yeah. management. Yeah, responsible recreation management, which is more than just search and rescue. It's right. it's waste management and all, and all traffic mitigation. I mean, yeah. like that. And I apologize. I'm not going to win that, but I do have to leave. Okay. But this has been a great discussion. <laughs> no, it's great. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, for thank all right, so, so do we, do we all feel good about these these cut these carbon reduction for the this board with these specific things. All right, so we will take that as as a thumbs up to wrap the, the strategic plan around these four. Um, the specific objectives, we take just a, a minute to walk, walk through those. These these are really again the, the high level specific uh, needs within the state. If there's any uh, concerns here, maybe we'll go by cardinal direction by cardinal direction. So we've had a lot of really good discussion uh, so far. So let's just take a, a couple minutes to, to think about those under the build and support collaborative partnerships. Um, so the specific objectives that we have listed, there are increasing the ability of municipal, county, state, tribal, and federal entities to access and share resources supporting development and maintenance of outdoor recreation infrastructure. Generally, the, the feedback that we got from a lot of the workshops was that all major outdoor recreation infrastructure projects require a collaboration and partnership across multiple entities. And as a result, we need to try to foster ways to make that collaboration and those back, back those collaborative processes uh, more intuitive, more easy for agencies to, to navigate, and as opposed to having them be reinvented every time a specific group wants to go out and get money. Uh, the second one, increasing the ability of user groups, nonprofit, and private industry to support infrastructure development and maintenance. Uh, we've presented some data before on the relative dominance of state funding for after recreation infrastructure development, but the general concerns amongst a lot of stakeholders that there's need for more maintenance. And so this really gets at the opportunity to fund maintenance through diverse pathways, um, not only funding maintenance through dedicated funds like the state park. Uh, restricted account, uh, but also funding maintenance needs through coordinated volunteer efforts or to private investments that might not want to support the maintenance of after recreation. Are you talking about OM and M for state parks or state assets or other assets? Um, more assets generally. So this this could take a, a variety of different forms, um, as, as general as a, an adopt a trail type of program or a program where individual corporations are volunteering their, their staff's labor. A lot of corporations are, are doing this now where they're allowing their staff to get paid for time that they're spent maintaining uh, infrastructure, after recreation infrastructure. So it could be uh, in-kind contributions, it also could be dedicated. I, I understand that part. My question is on the, the feedback that you got, that there's more need for maintenance. Was that on, on what, what, what needs more maintenance? What assets need more maintenance? Is state parks underfunded or is something else uh, getting in? It was not particularly targeted at state parks. Actually, state parks was, was one that really didn't come up. It was generally the, the need for, for maintenance for community municipal facilities, um, as well as federal assets, really. I mean, the federal assets were, was the biggest need there. And the bird maintenance backlogs, I think we put, we put in for um, one of our reports, the deferred maintenance backlogs, just for the National Park Service use, which is saving $300 and okay. a challenge for uh, local groups, volunteer groups or governments that want to help on a federal backlog is ridiculous. Like the, the days of like, oh, the Boy Scout Eagle Project will fix this bridge or this picnic area. That was like, oh, we don't have really as many Eagle Projects, but the Forest Service. You get a bridge, but you burn down a forest. That's what you yeah. have to do. almost have to have like a, a city or county willing to sign like a maintenance agreement, but then they need people and bodies and money to do the thing that helps their, you know, their uh, the asset that's in their community. And the capacity of the Forest Service and others to process those requests and make things happen quickly is yeah. through that. And then and you even frustrated groups that just like do a, well, we just, we just put in a bridge we thought worked because we got frustrated about the broken thing. Yeah, so it, it could be very informal and actually tend to, to prelude our one of our recommendations from the workshop report 
it, it could be as simple as setting up templates um, where agencies have worked really well with local volunteer groups uh, to mitigate some of that maintenance backlog. And so we looked at some examples like Cash County where it's been very, very successful um, and other, other areas where there's been a lot of volunteer time and federal assets, just making those types of uh, arrangements, those type, types of cooperative arrangements available to a, a broader constituency, sharing those resources so individuals don't have to go reinvent the wheel when they want to go maintain a, a resource on, on federal agencies. Um, and the last thing we have there is ensure infrastructure development and outdoor recreation management meets local needs. And the local needs is really the, the critical component of that recommendation or that, that objective. Uh, we heard in all of most, in more specifically in the more rural locations of the state, they did not want uh, specific large scale infrastructure investments imposed upon them, not having some input on how they were actually developed. And again, this gets at uh, Casey's recommendation of having some need for more small local. So for those objectives, is there is there any major concerns um, in how they can support collaboration and collaborative processes? Anything that we need to, to change for those? Good. Generally feeling good with those ones. Mm -hmm. um, the ones for improving awareness and education about safe and responsible recreation. Decreasing the need for search and rescue support for uneducated and ill-prepared recreations. We had that in our initial list, and it was rock, rock steady through all of the workshops. Nobody balked as it had the need for that. Uh, foster a sense of stewardship for Utah's outdoors. And this really also gets at the need for, for volunteers to support one of the units, uh, requests. Uh, so stewarding individual willingness to participate in outdoor recreation as a mechanism to get them back out into actually stewarding and maintaining those resources long term, which there's a lot of good research that suggests that that actually can happen. Minimizing conflict between different outdoor recreation activities, that's generally seen as, as a good thing. Uh, increasing awareness of the benefits of outdoor recreation, especially among marginalized groups. And this was one that did change to the workshop process. We particularly heard uh, from workshop attendees along the Wasatch Front that they needed to really focus on what the activity preferences are, what the needs are of, of historically marginalized groups along the Wasatch Front that either currently don't participate in outdoor recreation, because there's a large proportion of the state that doesn't currently participate in outdoor recreation, and the portion of you know, the portion of the state's population that does participate in outdoor recreation, but does so in unique ways that might not currently be met with the way that we've historically developed and managed outdoor recreation infrastructure. On that last bullet point, I would actually like to see that the term marginalized groups change the terminology to just to you know maybe to to groups that haven't tripped haven't always participated, you know, or that or where recreation uses um, has been low or something like that, you know, or or a broader a broader spectrum of recreation users or something like that. So Utah uses the term all users. That's what I like. That's all what I mean. um, um, among, among all users. Yeah. <laughs> Marginalized, I hear, could also be politicized. Like just the yeah. using that word, somebody's gonna like yeah. I fear they glom onto it and it might be a less yeah. provocative word. Yeah. 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 So just say sense. you could just simply say is um or increase awareness of the benefits of outdoor recreation among all or all users. For all users. I think that's right. It's that's by definition all inclusive. <laughs> or, or even all people. Yeah. Theoretically, if they're not using it, they're not users. Yeah. Potential yeah. users are just people. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So are we are we good on those four for the objectives for part of direction around the safe and responsible recreation? Make a change to include all users. That's uh, spot on. Um, increasing access to outdoor recreation while protecting natural landscapes. Um, we hedged a little bit here on not saying that there needs to be more focused investments in particular areas where there's a lot of demand or more particular areas where there's, there's not a lot of demand, but really create a, a more a broad statement, broad objective that just says that we need to provide uh, a wide variety of high quality outdoor recreations that range from the highly developed to the highly undeveloped. Just certain areas of the state, might want to develop outdoor recreation infrastructure in ways that is much more developed. In other areas of the state where there, there already is a lot of outdoor recreation infrastructure on, on the ground, 
might want to preserve those areas that provide more wilderness or solitude type of his experiences. So they would want to, to favor protecting those experiences that favor that, other, that end of the continuum. So we tried to phrase that in a way that wouldn't seem like uh, the commission and these recommendations are tailored more specifically to urban areas or rural areas, but if there was a need to really think about active recreation opportunities along that entire continuum. And it's gonna depend upon what those infrastructure investment groups are, depending upon where you are at in the state. I really like that, you know, that recognizing that there's there's a, we wanna think about the whole spectrum because sometimes you, you go to a national park and it's great and it's fantastic, but there's lots of crowds. But then other times when you have to go out and you recreate, you just wanna go out and be out there with nobody else around. And and having both of those things in mind is fantastic. That we think that's sort of captured. Yeah, and we, we particularly worded this one in a, in a way that would allow the Outdoor Adventure Commission uh, the ability to, to weigh any potential proposals or projects that might come in uh, relative to the the needs of whoever it is that, that applicant, the applying body. It's a, an area that really wants to preserve uh, a more wilderness type of experience, more salty type of experience, as long as they're saying they are providing that in complement to whatever is locally provided, that allows you to check that box and say, say they're really thinking about the system as a whole, as opposed to we're we're just, we know that there's a demand here, so we're, we're trying to meet that. Because in a lot of portions of the state, they might say, well, we think this is a really good idea. It's a compliment to what the infrastructure is that we have on the ground, but we don't really have a lot of data to say that it's really going to be used heavily. We don't really have a lot of investments or anything. So it allows the outdoor training commission a little bit more flexibility. Uh, and then about the second one there, ensure existing outdoor recreation assets are well maintained for decades to come. That was really persistent. That came through in all the spring workshops is that maintenance was a big concern, and that was just a, in preview time the survey data. It's the number one concern of the fact that the outdoor recreation opportunity impacts maintenance of outdoor recreation assets. Um, but any any concerns about those two specific objectives? Good. Good. Okay. <laughs> uh, the last three we'll walk through: uh, increasing the economic and health benefits. Distributing the economic benefits out to recreation to areas where use is occurring. Uh, we, we heard particularly from a lot of the communities in Southern Utah uh, that there was a lot of demand for outdoor recreation, a lot of outdoor recreation happening, but not a lot of uh, local sales taxes being generated by outdoor recreation. Uh, and so you know, this really gets at the fact that there's a lot of outdoor recreation happening in a certain location, but the economic benefits are being dis distributed. And this really isn't a fault of economic system or the policy system of within the state right now. It's more of just a fact of human behavior and how we plan our outdoor recreation trips. We buy stuff locally at home. Most of the people within the state live is along the Wasatch Front. When they go down to southern Utah, they have relatively marginal economic impacts to those communities that they're actually visiting. Uh, so the goal of a lot of people for outdoor recreation is to not spend any money, right? After the initial exactly. investment of their gear, their goal is not to cost a lot every weekend that they go out. But I think you could say the opposite. There but there's also others, yeah, that are trying to spend money. Yeah. There are some structural things too that could find that. Yeah. Um, second one, increasing the capacity of gateway and natural amenity regions to plan for and manage non-local visitation. Uh, again, particular issue in the southern portion of the state. A lot of really acute challenges in probably about a half a dozen to a dozen communities that deal with a hundred, maybe a thousand times the amount of annual visitation relative to the number of residents that they have. Uh, and so that leads to a whole bunch of unique issues from housing to transportation. Uh, and those need to be, be considered. So any of the issues that deal with gateway community development, sustainable gateway community development, um, should be given some sort of particular credence. We, we, we heard this in the, the five county region around Zion. We heard it very consistently in the six county region around Capitol Reef. Um, and obviously it was very, very pervasive in the southeastern region around marches and campuses. And the last one we have there is improve the ability of individuals to achieve the mental and physical benefits of outdoor recreation. This came from feedback along, along from a lot of the state the workshop participants that they expressed that that line of their work has never, it's always been important, but it hasn't been a direct uh, mandate that they have as an agency. Federal agencies realizing physical and mental health benefits of outdoor recreation are important. 
but it's very, very tangential to their job as managing the resource. State agencies traditionally have, have never even touched on that on that topic, particularly health departments, state division public health and safety doesn't, doesn't do that at all. So there is a need there. Who's going to actually screw that? And so that might mean you know, increasing the capacity to advocate for connections between the outdoor recreation, the physical and mental benefits that come from outdoor recreation, and um, the, the places where they can actually achieve that. Because it's on the margins of a lot of people's jobs, but it's, it's nobody's job in particular. And so that's really where that came up as a need. So any of those three specific objectives that um, raising concerns for anyone. Just a question on that last one. Um, improving the ability of individuals to achieve the benefits. Is it implied that awareness of that is, is part of that? I mean, there, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, there's tons of research that shows, but maybe a lot of people aren't aware of it. And, and if they were aware, maybe it would cause them to, it would increase their ability, just, just knowing. Yeah, I, I think awareness is, is a huge component to it. Also, access is, is also a huge component to it. So physical, proximate access. Uh, and so thinking more broadly about outdoor recreation, not just outdoor recreation from a traditional sense provided on public lands, but outdoor recreation is provided at a very municipal level. I mean, this is really the most people are participating in outdoor recreation in their daily jobs, their daily runs, out walking the kids with the strollers. That is the vast, um, the predominant way that people are participating in outdoor recreation on a daily basis. So increasing access and also increasing education. Yeah. Were there any, Either in this last box or the like improved awareness education side of things, are there any trends with any of these regional meetings around education to youth? I mean, we I mean we talk about not marginalized groups to all people, uh, you know, having access. But I was wondering if there any was there any themes around like instilling more outdoor yeah. education, outdoor recreation opportunities at a youth level or in our public schools or, you know. That's actually how we originally had it phrased in the, the original version of the objectives. And we brought in some, some data points like, well, there's actually more time mandated for kids to spend outdoors or less time for kids to spend mandated to spend outdoors than maximum security prisoners. And that's yeah, yeah, yeah. really persistent. Yeah. We mentioned that in the workshop. Um, that's not nothing that Utah, unique to Utah. Uh, and we really focused on that in the original objectives, but the key feedback that we got from multiple workshops was that, no, this doesn't need to be just about kids. We need to increase awareness uh, about these benefits for, for everybody. For everybody. Okay. Um, there was a lot of inter interesting discussions about the, the potential for targeting kids as a mechanism to get their, their parents uh, and caregivers more involved in outdoor recreation. And there's actually some really interesting research on how that can change other like environmental um, behaviors. If you, if you get people, get the kids involved, they're more likely to tell their kids, their parents about what they learned at school, and as a result, their parents are more likely to get, in, get involved in those activities. Yeah. But the, the general feedback was, no, this shouldn't be targeted at the kids. We really need to increase awareness about these physical and mental health benefits. Well, and, that, and that's why I asked it, because that last point, right, like ability for individuals to achieve mental and physical benefits, like at what point do we start educating kids that there's mental and physical benefit, like they're dealing with a mental issue or stress or whatever, like at what age can we introduce to them that like going for a walk or a run or riding your bike is a method to It's good for depression, it's good for exactly. things, you know, physical, mental, and full. And I think maybe it's that uh, um, one policy recommendation, our outreach efforts, another po possible campaign, right? But generally, on, on those final three, if, if it's more inclusive and just says everybody, not just kids, even though there might be some unique, unique mechanisms for how we get, get kids involved, everybody felt pretty good with those final three objectives. Yep. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, that's that's good. I think that these cardinal directions and objectives can be used in a, in a variety of different ways. Not only will they structure the strategic plan itself, but they can also be used, and this really gets into our, our next discussion point on the agenda. If there's going to be some ranking or criteria for how projects are brought to the Outdoor Adventure Commission, you can really look at these 12, 12 points and say they can be evaluated against with regards to what those projects actually are. So, question, and if the answer is no, that's fine, but I wonder if it would be valuable if commission members had another few days to maybe just mull these over and provide the feedback. 
Yeah, if, if you want more time, like at the end of the week, we'd be happy to provide more time. Yeah. And Darren, I apologize, I haven't been able to see you. But that would be great. Um, generally, generally, sounds like everybody is in line with the spirit of, of the specific objectives. There might be some some minor issues of, of wording. This will really help us as a research team start to frame out the plan for the area that uh, we're supporting research, the data, and everything going into the objectives. So, if you do have any feedback uh, beyond what was able to be shared today, feel free to do that. But what, like again, what, what I said is that these objectives can be used not only to bring up the strategic plan, but also to provide met metrics of how you're evaluating the projects. And so, hopefully, we'll provide that kind of structure to say this is not only what, what you as a group of 15 individuals want, but you as a group of 15 individuals also informed by hundreds of stakeholders who participate in dozens and dozens of hours of the workshops over the last six months. So, Thank you for entertaining the minutia of walking through strategic planning, wordsmithing, um, but it will really help us bring out strategic planning and make sure that we have an agreement on all the needs. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks for, for that. That was, that was a really good discussion. It was kind of a long discussion, but it was a really good one. Um, we don't have a, a lot of time, but I, I did ask to, um, to talk about um, a prioritization model as we start thinking about how we would uh, allocate the, the money that's in the restricted account. And I don't know, Charlie or Tara, did you have something that you were going to present on this? We were thinking that today could be a little bit more discussion based mm -hmm. um, after our last meeting with um, the USU team and wanting to just make sure that all of these objectives were in line with the commission, if, if this could be used as the, the ranking criteria for, for divvying out some of those bigger ticket projects. And then, Tara, did yeah, you want I to think, add? I mean, just to, to answer that, yes, I think the whole, like, kind of the idea of creating the strategic plan isn't necessarily just so that we, we, we have a great plan and then it just sits on a shelf, but that we'd actually use it um, as the guiding document for prioritization and allocation of resources. So yeah, that's that's really important. Yeah, I, I think there that that is the thing is all the, the what we're talking about spending the outdoor adventure recreation infrastructure restricted account, whatever long name you gave that <laughs> <laughs> um, is that it really should tie into the objectives of both what the outdoor adventure is you know, it's infrastructure initiative is all about, not the initiative, but the infrastructure adventure, and then the strategic plan. What's what's going to be the legacy behind this? And um, trying to discuss how that might be and what how that might be different from the grant and yet have some of the same ways of, of making sure that the applicants are you know, responsible and in, in the uh, project, with the project and so forth, we do have some types of things that we're talking about doing um, where, you know, you could have local community government entities who are going to, you know, recommend projects. And I don't know if you want to allow for like nonprofits or foundations to do that, because I was thinking it might be better, even if it was some partnership with the foundation, right. but to have those kinds of projects come through and so on. But I think there's a lot of details and I don't know if you want to discuss them here. We, I could go like one D, but. Well, so I didn't tee this up very well. Um, so let me provide a little bit more context. So um, in, uh, I think it was HB 384 from this last session, um, you know, the, the outdoor adventure restricted account was created a year ago. Yes. Uh, the previous year in 21, 22. Mm -hmm. yes. And, um, and, and, and um, so this year, in this year's bill, it was specified what percentage of that money would go to state parks and to the local your grant program that, that's already existing. We already have a process for that. But really the bulk of the money I think for this year, it's $19 million mm -hmm. 
for this current fiscal year that we're in is to be allocated by this commission, or at least recommendations from this commission to the legislature on how that money would be spent. Because this commission doesn't actually have the, the ability to just to, to write somebody a check, you know, like, like the UR grants, you know, that board has there's a process and there's authority to say, you know, oh, to actually award the grants. Mm -hmm. But but for, for this money, it's okay, what does this commission want to recommend to the legislature of how of where that money would get allocated? And what I and, and I would love to hear this group because there's a lot of different diverse perspectives here and a lot of, a lot of uh, institutional knowledge. Um, my thinking, I was kind of looking toward the UDOT model where you have like advisory councils that that advise on, okay, here's the recommended projects that we do in each of these regions on transportation. It still goes to the legislature to actually allocate those funds, but hopefully the leg, I think the legislature for the most part respects that process and says, okay, if this is what the this is what the recommendations are, we just approve, we approve the list uh, for funding. I mean, sometimes there's a few changes that are made, but um, that's my hope is that is that there's a uh, is that we can as a commission provide a vetted reviewed list that we've said we've looked at this criteria uh, our criteria and these are the ones these are the projects that we feel like best meet that criteria so that that gives it that gives the list and gives those recommendations credibility when it's when those things are uh, recommended to the legislature um what now there's a lot of nuts and bolts around that in terms yes. of like how do you apply do people even know that it's there you know is there a pro is there an application process like none of that has been stood up yet yeah and, and how does it balance against like normal rfas that are going to come in the morning of the session right from, right yeah and my, and people and my say hope, like, oh let's just pull from that account because it's an outdoor recreation project exactly my, my hope is that we can get requests like that that, that funnel through this process through this commission and and people aren't just like hogs the trough at the legislature just throwing in their RFAs um, for individual consideration that haven't been vetted and haven't been yeah. compared and prioritized against other priorities that might also be in this so list. So, or is there enough language in there to actually prevent what he's talking about? Well, so in number four, it, it says there's it, never it, enough it, language. There will no, always be direct. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah, never going to prevent that. Yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully, we can like minimize that. Minimize. Yeah. Yeah. And number four it says that if it's, if it's appropriated to the Department of Transportation from the account, then Transportation Commission, created in Section 72, shall prioritize. I think we could have another, basically another one that says if the legislature appropriates money to the Division of Outdoor Recreation, um, that then uh, the Outdoor Adventure Commission shall prioritize projects. Okay, and so that would be a, 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 an update to that statute. Mm -hmm. So, Jason, could it be that they not only that the Outdoor Recreation Advisory Commission um, reviews the grants, but could we approve them? And then rather than having to go through another legislative process so that we review, approve, and actually fund, and then we can report back to the legislature and kind of maybe cut out a step. Well, it says shall prioritize, but the language is shall prioritize. And I think that we would narrow that saying that this body, that this body would shall prioritize. And like you were saying, then legislature gets that list and they might be able to make an adjustment here. Yeah. But I think, I think cutting the legislature out of that process, that's going to be a tough sell in the legislature. I think the legislature wants to at least have some, have which, that oversight there. Which appropriations committee do you envision this going through? Because a lot of, a lot of, um, there, there's two places projects that might come in this general area go to. They either go to um, natural resources or they go um, to Beetle. Right. And the Beetle chairs have been particularly like, no local projects whatsoever. All right. of them are wiped off the list. Um, whereas natural resources, it's like it's very rural friendly. If your yes. project is rural, yes, it gets funded. And so, I think that's left local communities with projects feeling like. Right. And, and then as the session goes on, you get thrown into like some totally random committee because they have space on their agenda, and you're like, uh, I've never presented to these people before. <laughs> and I think probably a lot of stuff since the division of. Recreation is now under DNR. Like a it lot of that stuff that you go to DNR, but Natural but Resources Committee. I personally, I, I think another, and I have a, I guess I have a bias because this is the committee I sit on is the infrastructure and general government. That because that's where the transportation 
That's where all the transportation money comes. So this could be similar to that. Is that I think, I think IDG would be a good one. Yeah, wherever Jeff is, I say that's the committee we should go because so then we have a voice. And if, there, if you're a chair of any of these, let's go with that one. Right? Yeah, because it needs a defender. It needs a legislative defender that says respect. Yeah, yeah. Respect the process. Respect the process. Don't don't gut it. I mean, if you're going to change it, do it for a very good reason. Yeah. And don't just discount because it's local projects and locals have their quote unquote own own money. Yeah. Um, and don't just come in with your you know pet project and yeah. Only if you hijack the list, yeah. Yeah, so I think that's that's something that just worried me having watched it play out. The um the other part that's sometimes hard is if the legislative funding becomes if we're waiting for the legislature to approve it, then it's a, a Jan or a July one, right? Yeah. And most of these projects are gonna need to take place in the the construction season and July one is like we're in the middle too of late. Yeah. So that's the other problem with waiting on the legislature is either the legislature has to release it. You know when when you conclude in March, or we've got to change the timing somehow because that that's just a a challenge for any type of a construction project. Is this a continuous funding? I, it sounds like it is. I just want to make sure. But um, which leads you to the thought that this is a program, right? It, it isn't just a list of projects. This is a recreation program. Mm -hmm. So you start building years out through this process yeah. and so maybe that alleviates some of your concern so, in that so there's still bit, things unless you've only got a year to, to, to use it so if you're if you're beaver county and you get some yeah. trailhead and you've got you're trying to find a contractor who's already booked out right and then you've got to but then you've got to use it in spring so you know it's just it's yeah. a really odd timing well, well I mean, you know, like we are 28 months is the kind of period that we're that way kind of offsets that concern. Well, and, and I would say also we need to think about the types of projects that we're going to be targeting too, because if Beaver County wants a trailhead, I would say go to the UR grants, right? Because that's a very, that, that's on a smaller scale. It's very local. Um, and, and even with HB 384 from last year, you know, we more, you know, we almost tripled the amount of money for the UR grant. So there's, 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 Money there for those types you're, of you're projects. Right. You're right. But, so if, if you're and, using these objectives instead, it's like for planning. Yeah, it, could, it could be for planning, it, and so it's it's it was intentionally broader. There's not as many restrictions on that account, and so like even if we wanted to look at land acquisition, um, but particularly if there are projects that come out of the shared stewardship agreements um, through, the initiative. through the initiative, then that that's the. No, those could be funded out of the restricted account as well. If those niches that are not addressed by the right. work, the over the right. amount of conservation RTP, funding, yeah. the RTP, I mean, there's a, there, we have several grants, and there are probably some, some blind spots to some of those kinds of things, especially yeah. when it comes to the amount and the higher yeah. fellow. Yeah. But, but I think that's how we prioritize this, mm -hmm. is like we make the list, however they come in, we've got to figure that out, make the list, and then you assign or we assign what objectives they meet in this strategic plan you know the more objectives they meet maybe that's how it ranks so higher or something like that yeah. but then the same thing when a legislator comes in with an rfa and says if you want something to come out of this fund this restricted account we can look at it please give us a list of what objectives you're meeting if you're not hitting any of these objectives you're not going to get on the list or you're not going to get an rfa out of this uh, restricted account, right, right? Right. Now they'll still find ways around that or whatever. Just put it on an agenda for a committee. Like, exactly, you know, but I mean, that. I think that's the starting point, right? Like this account, this restricted account, the money, like, whatever the broad statement is, but the money being used. However, you know, this land acquisition, if it's infrastructure, if it's education, if it's mm -hmm. planning, all of that. Like, if you want money to come out of the account, like assign the objectives from the strategic plan to it, that might give them an uh, opportunity or anybody an opportunity to get familiar with the strategic plan as well, which is not a bad thing, uh, you know, for community leaders or whatever to understand this and why why it's here. But, you know, and then if it, you know, and I think that's how we prioritize. If we have projects come in the first year and one of them's knocking off five of these bullet points, like maybe high priority versus the one that's only, you know, it feels like DoDOT did a good job after revamping after a while, like protecting the 
regional priorities, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, you go through this very rest process in each of the regions to say these are the these are the projects in this order because because it makes sense with whatever plan and funding mechanism. Mm -hmm. But it took a while because it used to be end run all the time. Yeah. But now it occasionally does, but it's less. Yes. It happens True. a lot less because there was, I think, to Pitt's point, this it's more a, robust effort about show us the objectives, show us the, you know, why it makes sense from an engineering perspective or a programming perspective, or you know, that you have to do part A before you can fund part B. Um, instead of just skip to B because it's more fun. Um, but that that helped insulate that process. And then you have, you know, you have Senate president who who bought into it because he spent time on those boards. And I, so I think he might have to also spend time with, you know, asking leadership to back. Yeah. And how, then, how does Utah deal with like RFAs that come in the first week of the session that are like not on the I suggested list? Don't know that. <laughs> um, I do, can, you know, do you see a lot of you guys RFAs yeah. doing end runs anymore? Yeah. Like, I know. Um, planning and programming money for, for roads, yeah. For local roads, yeah. Doing yeah, end runs, but not yeah. through the, but not and changing the, a, a regional. The greatest plan. risk for this is all, will actually be less RFAs and more intent language. I can see all of this being allocated through intent language in the middle of bills. Yeah. yeah, I don't know how you protect from that. But that you have to get the commitment from leadership. You can't protect yeah. it. And you know, and, and I've I've been having those conversations with current leadership, but leadership changes, and I'm not going to be here yeah. forever. So my hope is to create a process that yeah. that far outlives me yeah. and, and the current. Yeah, and and one of the recommendations, policy recommendations from strategic plan is both regional collaboratives or councils, because then you build a kind of support network. So if there is some sort of end around or some attempt to use intent language, then you've got seven or whatever collaborative groups around the state that will object to it. Yeah. Or you don't have local governments going to their lobbyists to put in intent right. language in the bill of bills or something like that. Hopefully, if they're already in engaged in the hopefully, hopefully <laughs> right if they're already engaged in the like regional committees or something like that right so um i mean we, we've been going a long time i want to be respectful of everybody's time this is a really good discussion i think we're kind of like you know we're thinking along the same lines um we're also into the current fiscal year there's money in the account and so i think we don't we're, we're kind of behind the curve a little bit because we need to have projects and start discussing prioritization in then you know over the next couple of months and we don't even have we don't have a process people to tell us what those projects are yet so can i ask one more question yeah. real quick, just so we can think of that uh -huh. i think maybe we could start through this com commission reaching out or at least mm -hmm. informing people that maybe they need to start shooting some ideas our way but as a commission what are we comfortable with you know um amount wise like are we trying to say like if what the UR goes up to 500,000, are we saying we want recommendations or tasks that are over a certain amount because this is bigger projects? Or yeah. it could it be even smaller projects. Should we wait and see what we get? Well, we can establish that criteria. On that thought, Patrick, do you want to just kind of give an update as to where you are with the initiative and your outreach to BLM and Forest Service on their Sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, so you'll know, I mean, they, this is one thing that we do need to navigate is kind of what are the synergies when something like this that you all talk about this prioritization with the outdoor recreation commission and then the outdoor recreation initiative. Um, I, I've met with like National Park Service superintendents, I've met with the BLM leads from the states and Forest Service from the states. So I, I've got a pretty extensive list of projects um, that they have kind of gone through and vetted a bit. You know, I think BLM's project list alone is like $44 million worth of projects. And you know, we're trying to target, when I reach out to them, target cross jurisdictional projects that you know are maybe a little more complicated so the state can step in as kind of a management area in that um and also ones that do exceed those do work or this rtp over all of those fundings you know so i think your is our highest rewarding potential which is a seven hundred fifty thousand dollar ask so we're looking for a bigger ticket on those ones um for a service you know like multiple millions of dollars of projects um, national park service you know they, those are kind of like boundary areas outside of those with like liminal spaces um but yeah I mean, we have a, a pretty extensive Project list at this point, and then next That's steps good. for that for those lists as far as local. Yeah, the next steps, um, you know, it's really interesting hearing your conversations, you know, with, with 
kind of the recommendations in the area of association of governments, but it was to figure out, you know, somewhat similar to that watershed restoration initiative model was kind of working with maybe areas association of governments to have them help rank or prioritize what they want to see. Um, and then kind of bring those all in to, you know, I, I know we're going to meet with Representative Stenquist, I think we're going to meet with you see folks here, you know, there's a lot to be figured out still, but you know, we're, we're developing a prioritization and submission list as well. There, but there has been a lot of late work to at least identify those projects. So we have, we have a pretty significant list right now. Yeah, yeah, that's good. And I think that alleviates some of my concerns is like, where are we going to go find projects? Sounds like there's a whole bunch of projects. <laughs> yeah, that's thing in terms of this, if we're going to create a prioritization list or a, a, I guess, a, a vetting list. One thing Jason mentioned, have you used a word that you made me think of this. Um, we, we need to identify gaps. What doesn't fit neatly into another program that might deserve to be funded? And we need to have a category of gap funding of something, right? There's probably projects that don't fit neatly into a, into a box that probably deserve merit of consideration. And let, let's figure out how we don't just dismiss good proposals that because they don't check the boxes with one of these other programs. Yeah, there are several. We get those all the time. You work on it. And good example is one. We got a really good proposal from um, the submitter was basically in the Dutch John area, Glenny Gorge. A lot of outfitters there. Living, basically squatting on forest and have to be kicked out, moved around. So one of the proposals we received was how about you know, a campground with a few uh, cabins that. Are affordable, affordable housing for guys and outfitters. I mean, didn't and, didn't and you or but yeah. what, didn't something like this? Yeah. You have land up there. We have land everywhere. Yeah, you put the mountain camp. The site of John is also the land. The mountain camp. A lot of those. A lot of those. Yeah. 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 That's a, that's a good example of that. So yeah, I mean, that's, I want to make sure that we don't the projects don't fall through gaps. Yeah. So let's figure out how we sweep those up. Yeah, and that's why I think the, um, you know, I wanted the language to be um, intentionally kind of broad to give us the flexibility on, yeah. on filling up where the, just where the needs are. Think we All right, um, any other comments? Otherwise, I think we're looking like wrapping it up today. It's been a great discussion. Really appreciate everybody's time and participation. When's our next meeting? Because I always good, good feel like I forget to put it in my calendar and then I'm like, oh! So, We've been uh, kind of coordinating with USU to, on their progress to help set the meetings, but we could just plan for a, a month from now. Um, let's see. That'd be the plan us right after Labor Day. So the fourth, right? Um, we could also meet the 29th of August, same time. Um, after Rex summit is on the fifth, we'll probably give our team a break. <laughs> um, what? So the summit sixth and seventh. Yeah, I'm sorry. The, so if it was on the fifth, it's the sixth and seventh, and sometimes set up times. Sorry, that's what I was thinking. I just I'm didn't. concerned about Labor Day conflicts with that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Maybe Do you want to kick it to the next week after that, the week of the eleventh? Like the eleventh or twelfth or something. Once it's once the interims interims are the 18th and 19th. Okay. That's right. In your schedule, yeah. Okay. Sure. So that that week of the 11th is. Uh, okay. So we want to do the 11th or 12th. I think most folks said that the uh, Tuesday at this time works for them. Kelly okay. did, has an ongoing conflict at this time, but it worked for the majority of everyone else. So the 12th is. Awesome. Sure. If there's anything too that we can, you know, improve upon in communication about these meetings or, uh, you know, in USU's process, I know we talked about having a Google Drive with with some of their reports all in one place. But if you have any thoughts on what we can do to improve hosting these meetings and arranging them, please please let us know or let me know. I guess. So you're thinking you window two to four. Yeah. Sorry, I'm still stuck on my own account. <laughs> <laughs> yep, and we'll send that out. And I don't know if we'll be meeting in the auditorium or here. Uh, Construction is dependent. Through, September, through the entirety of September. All of September. Okay. Great. Thank you, USU, too, for all your work and presentation.
Thank you. Yes, thanks so much. Thank you. All right, uh, final motion. Motion to adjourn. The motion to adjourn, all in favor say aye. Aye. Thanks for nay. <laughs> Does anybody ever say nay on that motion? It's on the table. It's always one.